words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Rejoice, our Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. Jesus the Savior reigns, the God of truth and love. When he had purged our sins, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. His kingdom cannot fail, he rules o'er earth and heaven. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus given. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. Why should my heart be lonely and 
Good morning and welcome to each of you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you all for being here this morning for this time of remembering and celebrating the life of Ken Weaver. And also for us to hear the words of our Lord who said, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. So we also come today looking for comfort and encouragement from each other, from the word, and from the Lord. And so let us invite God's spirit to be with us. And uh, before I pray, uh, there's just a few comments I wanna make about our bulletin this morning. The poem that you find in here is one that the family found very meaningful, particularly with, uh, with Ken in the latter part of his life. And so I invite you uh, to read that at, uh, at your convenience and find that it is a very moving poem about the way in which God cares for us even as the day of life is coming to its end. And also that uh, the song leader this morning is going to be Tara Davis. So uh, just a note uh, to change in the personnel here. But let's invite God to join us in this time of worship, celebration, and remembering. Lord of life and Lord of glory, we give you praise today for the life of Ken Weaver and for all the ways, Lord, in which he touched so many. We invite you to come and join us now in this time of remembering. Be present by your spirit with us, Lord. Fill this place with your glory that you might fill our hearts with your love and your peace. Lord, as we remember today, we acknowledge that there will be both laughter and tears. And we know that these are all gifts that you have given us to feel deeply and to enjoy life to its fullest. So Lord, bless our time of gathering, bless our time of remembering, and Lord, bless us as we seek to do your will. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Following our hymn, Blessed Assurance, there are going to be several people who will be sharing. I'm not going to announce you. Just please come in the order that is printed in the bulletin and invite you to use the pulpit mic here. Please turn in your hymnals to number 435, Blessed Assurance.
Thank you. First Corinthians 12, Paul writes about spiritual gifts. And most of the time you think about tongues or healings or something like that. Let me quote from the NIV. Spiritual gifts, quote, those with gifts of administration. My brother had the gift of administration. We grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania and went to a little church called Vine Street. And uh, Ken was a little older than I was. And so I kind of followed him and his leadership ability. And when he decided to become a Christian, a few weeks later, I thought that was a good idea and I followed my brother. And then he worked with a bishop on baptism and uh, I followed my brother and got baptized. Well, Ken was leading the way. And then we gave out the way, a pamphlet called The Way. Now, I don't know if any of you else knew what that was. It was a, uh, like a sophisticated trap, track. And every, every uh, about twice a month, we would give these out into the apartment buildings and around the um, <clears throat> Vine Street Church and we would uh, give these out and put them out in the foyers. And uh, you might say that's Ken's first assignment with the church was giving out the way. Uh, it must have been just a Pennsylvania thing. But now I didn't follow up Ken very well in the next. We went to a one-room school in Willow Street. Willow Street's about eight or 10 miles south of Lancaster. All eight grades were in one room. Now, some of you who are teachers can't imagine that, but there were 30 or 40 students, and Emily Crable, she taught all eight of those classes. Now, when she taught seventh grade, Ken took seventh grade and did the assignments, and then when she taught eighth grade that same year, Ken took the assignments for eighth grade and he skipped a year. Well, I didn't follow his leadership very well. <laughs> I wanted to play ball. So when I got to seventh grade, the teacher said that I should repeat seventh grade. So I didn't follow my brother very well at that time. Uh, but the love for the church came through baptism and through uh, the Vine Street Mission. Then we moved to Virginia. And uh, my parents were called uh, to do mission work in Newport News. And uh, um, among the Jewish people, and Ron David, where's Ron David at? Right over here. Ron David became part of our family. He was 12 or 13 years old. And what happened there is when his mother passed away, his dad asked my dad, would you take care of Ron David? So Ron became part of our family at that time. And um, he went on to medical school and then now is a leader in autism, uh, a childhood. About that same time, uh, Ken, of course, came there and he was ready for college. When I went to Newport News and worked for my brother Lloyd, Ken went to EMC, it was at that time. And uh, he wanted to introduce June Marie to the family. Now, they were living, of course, in Harrisonburg, and we were down in Newport News, and Ken wanted us to meet June Marie. So he brought her down and was introducing her to the family. And uh, Mom wanted to make sure that she was welcome. 
So mom gave an extra large piece of cake to June Marie to say welcome. And Ron David piped up and said, that piece of cake is big enough to kill a horse. <laughs> now I ask Ron in the room back here, is it better to ask for permission or a forgiveness? So now you know what I was talking about. <laughs> well, Ken then went on to seminary at Goshen. Uh, but he never used a seminary degree to be a pulpiteer or a pastor. His calling was something else. And soon after that, he started with men I broadcast. And uh, well, I'm not, Melanie's going to talk about that, so I'll pass over that whole. And then I want to talk about this church. Now, I did not know there was going to be a display down here about this. But Ken and I talked a lot about this church. You know, most of you know that Chicago Avenue, they outgrew the space. And they began looking around for a place and where to locate. And some people wanted it right here. And even some people with money wanted it right here. And so that came a factor, too. And then the name, Harrisonburg Mennonite Church. Uh, they, yes, Chicago Avenue was one of the early ones in Harrisonburg, probably wasn't the first. But um, Ken talked about the debates and the arguing, uh, let's don't say arguing, discussions <laughs> about location. And this was just about out of town here, it was south pretty far. And um, so they debated and they talked about that and Ken would tell me who's involved and who's not involved and, and who the leaders were and who the pushers were and the shakers and all that. But Ken is the one that kept the wheels rolling. And so we're here today in this uh, church and it's up front. I didn't even know this was gonna be like I said and all the boards that he was on. So it's nice that we can celebrate Ken's passing on right here in the church that he did so much in helping it to, to, at this spot. So I feel wonderful that I can have a brother who was, had the gift, he had the gift of administration. Hi, I'm Melody Davis, and it's, this is just a wonderful uh, family here and the church and community. So my office was my second home, and my first boss became a role model for not only how to lead an organization, but how to leave graciously whenever the time came. Ken worked past the typical retirement uh, time of 65 and took his retirement age 67. He did so with great level-headedness, I thought, leaving the bones of a solid foundation uh, organization, and even though finances were a continual struggle. I never envied his position. I wouldn't have wanted the difficult work of deciding when to lay someone off or close down a whole program, but he seemed to manage the stress of those decisions okay. He was a master at keeping records and reports that summarized our work. He made sure our staff did the same, engaging in a two-day office-wide cleanup every other year, complete with a pizza lunch. On those days, we set aside other work and meetings in order to sort through, discard, organize, and send historical materials to Mennonite Church archives in Indiana 
and um, the things that maybe someday someone will want to research someday. Ken was not perfect, even either as a boss or a person, I suspect, but here are 13 things I learned from Ken as a boss and executive director. Research and development. Ken was a big believer and practitioner of always keeping some money in the budget for R&D. If you don't, it becomes harder to respond to issues arising out of the culture or church. Ken was instrumental in bringing an inter-Mennonite media group into being where four Anabaptist denominations cooperated in creating multimedia campaigns that were shared nationally uh, across the country. It was a work group with projects that members helped with depending on whether they had pin money to put into a project. One spinoff of this group was a professional association now called um, Anabaptist Communicators. It meant that was very important in meeting and receiving inspiration from others working in the field of media. Two, big ideas. Ken was always open to the next big idea. Reading up the latest, reading up on the latest business uh, gurus, that can sound maybe cheesy, but he didn't do it to sound one up. He was genuinely inquisitive. One such project was the, uh, something called the Vision Interfaith Satellite Network that we were a part of early on as a small denomination. We participated with huge denominations such as United Methodists and Episcopalians and Lutherans and more. Later, when we began producing documentaries on social justice issues and for network religious productions, the fact that Ken had stepped up earlier to participate in some of these uh, ventures gave us entree to a much bigger platform than the Little Mennonite Church, right? <laughs> Tackle new projects was another thing that he believed in. He rarely said no to a new idea or involvement in something the church asked him to do or explore. As an employee, I also learned not to say no to new work projects either, which I think helped me survive on staff for 43 years, such as one radio project very early when I was little more than uh, youth group age myself. Four, consult, confer, come home. He lived for meetings, amen? <laughs> he often also rearranged the furniture when he came into a meeting room, right? He'd come home with a, dictata a dictaphone tape full of memos, letters, proposals for a secretary to transcribe, or in driving or riding to a meeting with others on a business trip, you'd either have a pre-meeting in the car or a post-meeting in the car, which he would summarize in a quickly dictated memo when he got back to his office. Five, listen to the goals and needs of the church. Ken was a church businessman which meant he paid attention to the shifts and callings of the church, such as a 10-year effort at church growth called Vision 95. When the church began working on anti-racism issues, he asked me to serve on that team for Mennonite Media. It was probably among the most challenging work I was asked to do. I came home practically in tears one time where participants couldn't come to an agreement. In jumping on this effort in the late 1990s, we were ahead of many mainline Christian denominations. Six, continue education. Ken was a strong supporter of allowing and prioritizing continuing education for all of us. When possible, he would send at least two staff to one event so that they could process it together and bounce ideas off of each other. Seven, hire kids. He gave young kids like me just out of college chances to do something big, even if at the time, turned out a little amateur. This one wasn't amateur. He hired Jerry Halsopel to produce Shalom Lifestyles and a creative series of peacemaking videos for children. Ron Byler, who's also here, was a young producer for the All God's People discussion videos in the style of the day. I guess Ken sensed youthful employees can be innovators. Think of the college kid who invented Facebook, right? Eight, don't hesitate to send your staff. If Ken didn't have time for a certain meeting or involvement, he didn't hesitate to send one of us. Along with others, I had turns representing um, our agency and by extension, the Mennonite Churches at the National Council of Churches in New York. Our contacts and camarader camaraderie with uh, folks there helped to lead to great connections with the Odyssey TV network or others and produced and provided so uh, sources for funds for the hour-long documentaries 
that we got to produce from 2000 to 2010, just after Ken was retired, but his visions continued. Nine, stay accessible. Ken didn't talk a lot about being open and transparent, but he was. He tapped shoulders, walked into your office without an appointment, kept religiously one-on-one -on -one check in meetings with us as staff. He also summarized key points in memos so you knew your marching orders. But he didn't, I didn't find him to be a meddler or a check in on prog progress. I was generally excited to go to the meetings with him because he'd often introduce uh, compelling new projects. 10, allow entry level staff to try new things. I was first a secretary, then a secretary writer, and paid at a split level, which I don't think they do anymore, um, became producer and then an ex executive producer. But too often entry level folks get stymied there because of personnel guidelines that, uh, instead of their own initiative. Close down, let go, get out. Ken knew when to cut his losses and close down programs. I think of choice books. It's still going in another situation. He did so mostly with grace and good feelings. Unfortunately, this is another part of innovation. Things don't always work out. Times change. He was willing to let go of things. Invite staff to board meetings. This goes against most current models, I think, of board staff relationships. But I learned much while sitting in on board meetings or taking minutes. Don't shut your staff out if you can uh, at all afford it. Staff need to know who the board is and have a place to turn. 13, that's my last one, change is constant. When I think about the era that Ken lived through and all the technical inventions and applications that came into being, we get a picture of the future. Even our scriptures end with a book of, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 21, one goes on to say, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. Talk about change. We may not understand all of the prophecy, but our own lives teach us not to whine for the way things were. But like Ken, at times we must accept change, move on, and walk humbly with our God. Good morning. I'm Don Weaver, son, youngest son of Ken and Jim Marie Weaver. I have a disclaimer on the front end of this. I got input from Carol and Jim and Bill on this. Uh, most of the good stuff in here is from them. Any errors or inappropriate statements are totally mine. <laughs> and by the way, Carol told me I could say whatever I want, so hold on. In the 1990s, a president of a very large multinational company was asked about the meaning of the company philosophy that had just been rolled out where the last statement was that work should be a main focus of life. He responded with, I have three focuses in life, family, faith, and work, but don't make me tell you in what order. Dad could have easily responded with something similar by saying that faith and the church, work and family were his main focus in life, except that he would have had the twist to have not seen a separation or a trade-off between the three. Because his work was for the church and his family was integrated into both. Whether it was a family vacation that often included a Mennonite convention in the middle of it, or that people that he worked with showed up at our house and stayed on a regular basis, or that it seemed like we were always going to church. There was rarely a distinction in our growing up years between the church, work, and family. After Dad's passing, Carol was looking through some boxes and found two very interesting documents. His resume, which in the spirit of keeping things or to leave and after the fact he had updated in 2014. <laughs> and his philosophy, 
which he had written down to identify the 10 items that were on the list of things he had learned about how he had operated over 40 years. Um, when we read those, it revealed a whole variety of things that I think we knew about in some manner, but not the full extent. His resume revealed that he had his fingers, no surprise at all, in a whole bunch of different stuff. And most of the time, KJ was in charge. His philosophy also then revealed some beliefs behind the behavior that we saw. Number 10 on the list is one that, full, that especially stood out to me. By the way, this is a different list than her list of 13. This was Ken's list. His last list, his number 10 on his list was start the family, then build the house. So here are a few stories of what I think that looked like to us as his children. Dad seemed to do everything he did with energy. He worked hard and he played hard. Jim recalls being told, you have to finish a job, even if you're too tired to do so. This carried over into his play as well. We typically went somewhere in the summer on vacation and one summer we were at a beach. None of us is quite sure which beach it was. It could have been anywhere on the East Coast where they had the typical beachside attractions. At this one, there was one of these one of these rides that was large human swings. They were a big metal cage on a pivot, and you could get in and start to rock the cage back and forth. And the goal was to see if you could get the cage to go over the top, to go a full 360 over the top. So, Jim and Dad each got in a cage, and the contest was on. So, not surprisingly, Jim, being a little younger and a little more athletic, got his over the top, but Dad didn't give up. In fact, the right operator, Mom, Carol, Bill, and I were afraid that Dad was going to have a heart attack as he grunted and groaned and exerted himself to get that swing over the top. But he did. He finally did because you needed to finish a job no matter what. As a family, we were not well off financially. Remember, he worked for the church, but we always had enough. There was always food on the table, clothes to wear, and cars to drive. There was the annual trip to the stockyard to buy a steer, to raise, to get, get beef. There was the every three months or so when the Branner chicken took out that all the coals came over and the, we got a chance to do butchering. We got milk from the benders and we had a huge garden. And occasionally there was a treat, like the time that Dad was following a dairy truck. And for some reason, the back doors on the dairy truck came open, and ice cream, five-gallon tubs of ice cream came tumbling out. So what did Dad do? He pulled over, picked the, picked the ice cream up, brought it back home, put it in the industrial freezer that we just happened to have in the basement. That's a whole other story about where that came from and then called the dairy to let them know that their driver was gonna be short product when he got back. They said, well, it's been off the truck, keep it. So we had ice cream, well, normally it was just Neapolitan. We had all kinds of really good ice cream from there. The cars we drove were not fancy, but they got us where we needed to go. And in that process, we learned a little bit about a passion and a hobby and a guy named Ralph Nader and the Corvair. Our lives were also enriched as we took in others to live with us. Cousins, a grandmother, EMHS students, all to help make sure that there was enough. Enough experiences, enough sacrifices, and enough lessons about life with others. Dad saw a big world through his work, which had him travel internationally. And he showed us as much of the world as he could. We traveled a lot, usually a station wagon pulling a camping trailer. And we saw almost all of the East Coast, if not all of the East Coast, and the vast majority of the states east of the Mississippi in our travels with, as a family. But perhaps the story that stands out most to me was in 1977, so Jim and, and uh, Carol did not get to go along with this, but Bill and I, with mom and dad, there was a Mennonite convention in Estes Park, Colorado. So you think Harrisonburg to 
Estes Park and back, right? That would seem to be a logical trip. Well, our trip included stops in St. Louis, that's on the way, the Badlands in South Dakota, not on the way, back to Heston for a, ho a college visit for Bill, to Estes Park, then to Salt Lake City, then to San Francisco, then to the Redwood Forest in California. Then, because we were trying to get to the Ford Corners, we had to go through Vegas, and on the way in, the car overheated, so we got the nice trick of, well, you just roll down the windows and turn the heater on, so the little red light that says that the engine's too hot will go off. Oh, it was 110, right? So you can imagine how fun that was. From there, we went to the Four Corners. We managed to go to the Hopi Indian Reservation and then see in Amarillo, Texas, the guy who had more money than he knew what to do with and buried Cadillacs in the ground. There was then a long way home uh, from West Texas. Fourth thing from Dad, he thought long-term and invested for the long haul. So the house that we primarily grew up in on Route 42 North used to sit on top of an open hill with a nice view of Harmon's Hill across the road. I drove by two days ago and you can't even see the house because it's completely encircled in trees that we planted a long time ago. Trees that he got for free from the Forest Service that were no bigger than your finger when we planted them. Oh, and remember the work part from the prior piece? Yeah, we got to help plant them and water them and make sure that they survived. So that truly was a long-term investment. Those trees were still not that big when they left, but today there's a virtual forest on that property. Dad also pr planned long-term in housing and real estate that had long-term payoffs. Now, those of you know who mom knew that living in town was the thing she had absolutely no desire to do. She wanted to be out in the country. But somehow he convinced her that if they built a fourplex in town and lived there for a period of time, it would allow them to get to their dream property to live in the woods, which they did for many years. So these are just a few stories that I think are glimpses into how dad loved us in the way that he knew. He made sure we had what we needed. He taught us to love God and the church. He taught us how to work and play. And he taught us how to treat others. And for those things, we will be forever grateful. I'm Cynthia Morris, and I am the oldest granddaughter of Ken. So this is um, what I wrote about my grandpa as explained using three F words, faith, family, and food. Faith, from his college education to his work experiences to his membership at Harrisonburg Mennonite Church, my grandpa served in many roles that allow him to reflect his faith. Family. From the first day he met his first grandchild, me, Grandpa had a smile on his face, and unfortunately you weren't able to see the slideshow, but hopefully you'll get to see that some other time. Even before I was born, even before his own children were born, he and Grandma valued family and spending time together. This was evident in the many trips and vacations that they went on. I especially remember camping at Pipestem State Park in West Virginia and going to the beach every year at Nagshead. I remember he always liked to have the day's schedule planned out, just like me. Playing games was also fun when getting together as a family. And then finally, food. The family always referred to Grandpa's practice of eating as grazing. He loved to snack, especially on those big hard pretzels or whatever snack he could nibble on like party mix. He was also often seen with a cup of coffee. Family gatherings often included way more food than everyone could consume. And later in life, he was part of the Romeos or the retired old men eating out. I will always remember Grandpa because of his faith values, the importance of family, and his love of food. Grandpa, if you haven't done so already, give Grandpa a great big hug from me. I love and miss you both.
turn to number 419, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Our scripture this morning is taken from the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4, and I will be reading verses 7 through 10. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he or she has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in all its various forms. 
I have had the privilege of participating in the memorial services of several people who have had a profound impact on the lives of many, many people. And it truly is my privilege to add this service for Ken Weaver to that list. We've heard from family and from coworker how Ken and June Marie shaped each of their lives and the lives of those around them. And while Ken's family is clearly and unequivocally the most important part of his life's impact, Ken's life reached literally across the globe. His work was done in faith, faith in Jesus, faith in God's kingdom of grace, joy, deliverance, salvation, and peace. And if I were to sum up my impressions of Ken in one word, it would be this, busy. He was always busy doing something. And while busy, at least my experience was, if you needed his attention, you got it. I grew to deeply appreciate Ken in all the ways that he gave so much to so many. And as we gather here today, we know that for Ken, faith has indeed yielded completely to sight. He is free from the confines of this life, and we all look forward to the final day of resurrection. And we find much comfort and encouragement in the promise of resurrection. But that leads me to a question that, I, that kind of came to me as I was pondering this, this meditation. And that is, is the resurrection only about something in the future? Is it only something about what we look forward to? Or does resurrection have something to do with the here and now? You know, Paul uses a lot of space in his first letter to the Corinthians discussing the resurrection. He even gets into the weeds, if you will, about what the eternal state will hold for us. And let me read just a portion of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, and I'm going to start reading kind of in the middle of verse 44. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth, and as is the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. A body awaits. We are not going to spend eternity, if you will, as disembodied spirits, but whole beings, body and spirit. Let me ask you, why? Why is that so important that Paul had to take all this time when you consider how short these epistles really are, I mean, to spend as much time as he did on the resurrection? Why is it important that we realize and know that we are going to be embodied for all eternity. Well, to find the answer to that, we have to travel back to Genesis chapter 2 in the creation story where we read about God planting a garden in Eden and then God places the man there and in Genesis chapter 2, 15, it says he places the man there so that he might tend and work the garden, doing something with hands, eyes, feet, the whole body. And so I'm going to infer since in many ways eternity is the reaching back to what God originally intended and making it even better, that eternity is not a forever worship service. Now maybe for some they're going, hmm, I, you know, I always kind of figured that all we do is just, you know, be in this big church service for all eternity. Well, I don't think so. We're not going to float around on puffy clouds and play harps all the time. I can't play the harp anyway. <laughs> Nor will it be a permanent vacation where all we do is play. 
even if it is on those swings that, you know, you have to figure out how to get them to go all the way around. God created us to have a purpose. Yes, it's to serve and worship the Lord. Thank you, Westminster Shorter Confession. But even in creation, God intends for us to have something to do that is productive. And I think that raises an interesting question of what heaven or eternity will be like. Let me ask you this question. Would Ken find eternity to be heaven if he didn't have something to do? <laughs> Seriously. I mean, think about that. Why would God give us bodies fit for eternity and then nothing to do? The difference in eternity is that the curse is removed and work is not toilsome. Now, I'm not talking about us having careers or punching time clocks and that sort of thing. But if we are not engaged in life in its fullness in eternity, there's no purpose to what we're doing, then indeed, what is the purpose of eternity? Which it leads, leads me to the question that I can't answer, which is, what has Ken already found to do? But I think then that has something very important to say to us now and very important about how Ken lived his life. Because living, which we are to do as believers in Christ, living in the resurrection now, that we engage life and the work of the kingdom as we are enabled by the spirit in that spirit of the resurrection. Ken was one who was able to happily marry the work of the kingdom and his life work into one, as we heard so wonderfully said by family. I mean, we know that Ken was integral in taking the Mennonite church into the world of media. He engaged in broadcast ministries from uh, recordings to radio to documentaries. I mean, this was his mission, his passion. He worked for the mission, not for the wealth. His goal was to allow the good news and all the ways of the good, that the good news applies to reach an ever widening circle of people. You see, Ken was living in the reality of the resurrection right now with purpose, with joy, with a sense of this is what God has for me. Already living in the light of eternity. And he lived that to its fullest. Now, we heard from Don about his resume. I actually have a copy of the 2017 resume. Okay? Shall I read a few of these? I won't read the whole thing, because in all honesty, it's about as long as my meditation. But just a few things he was involved in. Um, church boards and committees, Eastern Mennonite University, Board of Trustees, Board of Executive Committee, Board Vice Chair, Chair of Committee of Trustees, Chair of Seminary Overseers, Mennonite Board of Education. Um, he was on the Theological Education Committee, Virginia Mennonite Conference, Pastoral Support Task Force Chair, Faith and Life Commission Chair, Virginia Mennonite Retirement Community, Board Member, Vice Chair, Policy and Performance Committee, uh, Foundation Board, President, CEO of Search Committee, Mennonite uh, Church Reorganization. I was a part, I'm, I'm sorry, that's a different one. General Task Force, part-time. Parkview Mennonite um, Agency Council. Uh, he also was part of the Inter-Mennonite Media Group. Uh, Council on Church and Media, Communication Commission, Na National Ch Council of Churches, and this one, it's kind of a long list here. He was on the Board of Managers, Interfaith Medium uh, Systems, member of the Steering Committee and also Vice Chair, Cable Emerging Technologies Committee, One in the Spirit Consortium. He's also part of the World Association of Christian Communication, uh, North American section of the World Association of Christian Communication, National Religious Broadcasters member, Certainly part here of Harrisonburg Mennonite Church. We heard from Sam about how the building came to be here. He was a youth group leader, a Sunday school teacher, chair of the elders, uh, chair of the prayer committee, church historian, strategic planning task force member. He was part of the Valley Brethren Mennonite. Okay, that's enough. Ken was busy. But what I want to say in saying all of that is that Ken was already living in the power of the resurrection already living that joy of life 
that God has for us, not just here, but for all of eternity. And I'll also say this, something would be missing if I also didn't emphasize the other part of being an embodied being that's also right there in Genesis. And that's relationship. Because in Genesis chapter 2, right after God places man in the garden, God says, it's not good for man to be alone. And so God creates another. And both man and woman together are the image of God. Relationship, family, friends, work. We've heard all of these things in the way that Ken integrated all of these into one in his life. And so I don't need to repeat anything that has already been said this morning. I did observe the relationship Ken enjoyed with June Marie. I know he deeply loved his children and grandchildren and greats. And Ken was a great friend to have. He was a giving man, compassionate in his own way, caring. Again, he lived in the resurrection right now. He embodied the resurrection right now in the way he lived his life. And now he's living that out, that new life in Christ. And it's that new life in Christ that calls us to love each other, as Peter wrote, to offer hospitality, to use the gifts that all of us, Ken, was given. Administration. Thank you, Sam. Speaking the very words of God, serving with the strength God gave, seeking for God to be the one who receives the praise and the glory. And so let me ask you on behalf of Ken this question. What is your life's mission? What is your life's mission? Where do you find joy in life? For those of you who are not yet in careers, let me offer that you consider how you can live in the reality of the resurrection in whatever you do. And when you do it, do it for the Lord's glory rather than your own enrichment. And perhaps even consider full-time service of the church or the ministry of the church. For those of you in jobs and careers, practice these exhortations that Peter gave. Show and live God's love. For those who are past careers and in retirement and still active, take this time to find ways to give directly to our communities as part of God's mission to extend love and mission. Be gracious and generous with God's love to those who are around you. And for those who are now beyond the ability to serve directly, may you find ways to be an encourager, a supporter, a sharer of God's joy. Regardless of your position in life's journey, make it part of, if not the totality of your life's mission, to let the glory of God shine through your life, shine through that new life that you have in Christ. Because that's what I saw Ken do. Now, I got to know Ken first in a much deeper way when we were in the process of creating Mennonite Church USA. This was at the very end of his work at Mennonite Media and uh, had the privilege of later becoming his pastor and saw how he lived such an active retirement. Always appreciated his wise counsel and encouragement. His work, his mission, was to engage in the life God gave him in every possible way. And so his legacy does live on. It lives on in now Menno Media. It lives on here, Harrisonburg Mennonite Church. It lives on in all those other organizations that I read just a portion of that he was part of. And it lives on in his family. May God inspire all of us to embrace life as Ken did. Knowing that we will embrace life in a whole new way in eternity. Because as Paul ended this passage in 1 Corinthians 15... In verse 58, he says, Therefore, my dear ones, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know your labor in the Lord is not in vain.
turn to number 340, 340. And let's stand to sing if you're able. Lift your glad voices. Following the closing prayer and benediction, we had hoped to show you the slideshow again. I apologize, technology. We'll get it figured out sometime. But uh, the family is going to gather in our east foyer for you to greet them. Um, and so if you want to wait just a little bit so that we don't just all pack in there, that would be helpful. Um, Tara will play some hymns for us. If you do not wish to greet the family, we invite you to exit here out of the south doors. Um, and, uh, and, and thank you for coming. Um, and again, if, if, after you greet the family, you may exit out of the East Doors. And again, thank you all so much for coming to this time of remembering and of worship, of laughter, and of tears. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we go from this place filled with the wonder of what you have given us in life. And knowing, Lord, that in you, life does not end. We thank you, Lord, for the ways in which we have shared in Ken's life. And the way that Ken shared life with us. Encourage us, Lord, to show that same love and grace that we have received to others. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Rejoice, our Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. Jesus the Savior reigns, the God of truth and love. When he had purged our sins, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. His kingdom cannot fail, he rules o'er earth and heaven. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus given. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. God of our strength, enthroned above, the source of life, the fount of love. Oh, let devotion sacred flame, our souls awake to praise thy name. God of our strength, we wait on thee. in days of mirth. God 
should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy, I sing because I'm free. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. 
Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. Jesus the Savior reigns, the God of truth and love. When he had purged our sins, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. His kingdom cannot fail, he rules our earth and heaven. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus given. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice.